Hi there once again and welcome to another Espresso Mechanic tutorial. And in this one we're going to be rigging this solenoid contraption that you see on the screen. And this is actually an exercise in random number generation. And I was asked to do this by a person who refers to themselves as Republic Tartar Stan. So a shout out goes out to you for this one. Now what we're going to be using to achieve the desired result here is a combination of Espresso, Python and of course Dynamics. And on this occasion we're going to be using the bullet dynamics. I do have a link in the show notes to the seam file which you can download so be sure to do that before you start the tutorial. But anyway that's what we're going to be about in this tutorial so without further ado let's see if we can make this happen. The first thing we need to do is actually start rigging the dynamics. The spheres will of course need to be rigid bodies so we'll come into our bullet tags here grab a hold of a rigid body and they've all got them and then we can start looking down here and seeing what we need to do. Now in the dynamics tag we, we can or tab we can use nothing in here we don't need to change anything. So our collision tab we do need to take a look at this. We can leave the shape as automatic we don't need to worry about changing any of that. The only thing we really need to change is the friction. We'll make that 10%. Apart from that, we don't need to worry about any of the other tabs. Everything can stay the same, so it's very simple. Fantastic, so we've got our spheres. We can close those up. Our light assemblies, the light bases, these are key. We need to give these collider tags, so we'll select all of them. And just our last one there. Oops, hang on. I don't want to do that. Just want to select the light base. Okay, so they're all selected and we can give those collider tags. So we'll give them collider body tags and then we can think about looking in here and seeing if there's anything we need to change. Well, there isn't. There's not a single thing that we need to change in here. Everything can be left as exactly as it is. So those are sorted out and we can move on from here. We'll just close the log up actually. The wire form assemblies. Now, these sleeves, they're invisible, but if we just make one visible, you can see that we've got these inside of the actual wireframes, and these are tube objects with no caps. So we'll just make those all invisible once again. So as sleeves, we just need to go through, select all of those, and then we can give those collider body tags also and then do the necessary adjustments and once again there aren't too many of those to do but that's all of our sleeves selected and we can reach for our collider body once again now on this occasion we don't need again to do really anything we can this static mesh is the only thing we need to change we just make that a static mesh and apart from that the bounce of the friction yep we can probably leave that um, we can perhaps change the friction, make that 10% actually, because I just think that makes it a little bit less likely to get jammed up in there if you do that, make that 10%. But other than that, just leave everything else the same. Fantastic. So that's our wireframe or wireform assemblies dealt with. The support assemblies, there's nothing in there. Don't need to worry about any of the objects in there. They're just completely inanimate objects. The next thing we need to do is open the rods. Now, these cylinders. This cylinder here is obviously going to be pushing against the sphere. So these are the ones we need to worry about on this occasion. So we'll select all of those. And that's the last one. And then once again, reach for the collider body tag. And on this occasion, we've got everything set up. Static mesh is fine bounce but the only thing we will change again we'll just change the friction and make that 10 and that's fine that's everything set up with regard to the dynamics moving on from here then we can start to think about espresso we already have an espresso null in the scene let's give it an espresso tag we've got the window open and we're ready to start doing a bit of work now as I mentioned, this is an exercise in random number generation. 
So the first thing that we're going, we're going to bring in is going to be a random node. So we'll bring one of those in. It's got a random seed at its input stage and we'll put an integer at the output stage. And this is important because if you use real values, it ain't going to work. Now we need to generate a random index value for each of these solenoids. And this is the first step in here. It says positive only and time. Now I'm going to set the time, the actual mode to free because that's where it should be. So free mode, positive only. I will check this. There isn't actually a need to because we're only generating a random seed really at this stage, but I will use that. And the random seed value 4711, you can change it if you wish, but I'm going to leave that as it is. So that's our random seed technically set up and it will generate random integers. Now, if we get a result node, just take a look at what this is actually doing. We can see that straight away it's generating quite a huge number. Now, you can't make this number any smaller from here. However, there is a way to get numbers between zero and nine. We've got 10 of these. So we want a, a value for the index value to start from zero and end at nine. So that's what we've got to sort out next. To do that, we come into our system presets, general presets, random integer, and bring one of these in. Straight away, you can see that it's got a lower and upper limit. OK, now what we need to do is set this up. So our lower limit, we can say leave that as zero because we said we wanted our first solenoid here to be zero and this needs to be nine. So it will generate those numbers. Now, what we can use is the integer value that's coming out of here. We can place that in the random seed. And that will generate our random numbers. And now if we get a result node and plumb this into here, we can see straight away that we've got two there. And if we just skip through the timeline, we start to generate random values between zero and nine. So that's working perfectly well. Brilliant. So our first part of this is now set up and it's ready to go. Now, what we want to do is generate a random number and hold that random number every 30 frames. So we're going to be using a modulo. The next thing then is to bring in a time node. We'll bring one of those in, do my usual thing of deleting the time port and adding a frame port so that we've got that there. We can then bring in a math modulo. So bring our math node in, place it here, plumb the output of our frame port here into the input one, change the function to a modulo and place 30 in there. And that means that every 30 frames, we're going to be grabbing a hold of whatever's coming out of here. Now, in order to do that, we need a freeze node. So we'll bring one of those in, place it over here, plumb the value, or rather the integer output of the random integer into the value port. And the output of the modulo can be plumbed into the switch. So we've got that set up like that. Again, let's bring in a result and see what's actually going to happen. We've got nine in there at the moment. Let's just play. We're not seeing anything because I need animation refresh. Let's just do that. And we can see that every 30 frames we're getting a number. It will generate the same number twice on occasion. That's not a problem, but we can see that we're getting a random number every 30 frames. Fantastic. So that part of the setup is working. Might as well keep that result in case we need it for something else. So that's how you generate random numbers and how you grab a hold of a random number and store it on this occasion every 30 frames. Of course, you can change this modulo value, do it every 60 frames or whatever, you know, whatever you choose to. But that's how I'm going to do it. 
Moving on from here, then we can think about our next step. And basically what I'm going to do now is actually set up some colors, which I'm going to be using to pass to each of these light panels here. So we might as well get that done. We'll bring in a condition node and we need to change its data type to color and we'll add some more inputs. We've got three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and one more for 10. How many have we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We still need one more. And that gives us 10. Now these are ready to receive their colors. The switch is going to be controlled by the output of the freeze because that's generating the numbers that we need. And then we simply need to decide what colors we're going to place in here. Well, we'll just do the standard fair, red, green, blue, we can do orange, so we might as well do cyan, mightn't we? Let's bring that up, bring that up. It, it really doesn't matter what you put in here, but we'll do the, uh, the colours as I'm doing here. Let's see if we can get like a pink there, that would be quite good. What else can we do? do something like yeah let's do a, a different type of green that'll be fine uh, let's have a look pull that up possibly do yeah sort of a mid sort of blue that'll be okay I think something like that and then last one, we'll, we'll make this a darkish sort of red, I think. Um, somewhere sort of there somewhere. That'll do, that'll do fine. In fact, let's go 50%, just go 127 on the red. So it's a darker red. That's fine, so we've got our 10 colors and they're ready to go. We can then move on from here and think about where we're going next. Now, let's have a think about what we're doing. We actually need to define the first of four link lists because what we're going to be doing every 30 frames, we want to trigger one of these solenoids and make the rod shoot up and obviously push the sphere up until it touches this base plate here. And that's going to trigger the light being switched on. That's what we're going to do. So we'll bring in a link list. And then we can think about populating it. Now, what we need to populate this link list with are our rods. If we twirl open our rods, we can see that we've got them all and we can select all of these. And that's all of those selected. Then we can come back to our link list, get the eyedropper and bring them all in. So they're set up and they're ready to go now. These will initially be triggered by this freeze node. Once again, this is going to be playing a major role in all of this. So we've got that set up there and it's ready to go. Now, in order to trigger these, we're going to need a monoflop. Now, we can't use the standard monoflop because if we do, it just won't work properly. We've got to code it and that's why we're going to be using some Python. But before we get to there, we've got to do a check as to what's coming out of this modulo. So we'll bring in a logic compare, place it here, plumb the output of the modulo into input one and everything in here can stay the same. It just needs to be equal to zero because when this has gone through its current cycle, and that will be of course every 30 frames, we know that it will be producing a zero at this output. So that's what we're looking for here. And then this is going to be our trigger for our monoflop. OK, so the next thing that we need to do then to create the link between these two is to actually do some Python. So we'll bring in a Python node. And then we're ready to start work on this and we need to start setting it up. 
For a start, we can remove all of its ports, apart from the output, because actually that is fine. And we can just double check to see what we've got there. We've got a real value. We do need a real value of the output. And what we'll do is make this one position Y. So we'll change its name, pos underscore Y, and we'll add another float value at the output and we'll make this one height. Now the height will be used for something else but the position Y is the one that we're going to be interested in first. So what we'll do is at the input stage add an integer and we'll rename this trigger add another integer at the input stage and this will be called frame. And you can guess that the output of the time node here is going to be plumbed into here. And we might as well do that right now. OK, so we've got our Python node set up as needs be. And that's great. The next thing we can do then is switch to a scripting layout, double click on here, click on here, open in Python editor, and we're ready to start thinking about doing some coding. First thing I'm going to do is remove this line because we don't need it. And then we can think about adding some more global variables because we do need actually four of these. We can add height, and then we want run and start time. And there are our globals. The next thing we need to do is actually add a spline. And if we just open this up and select the Python node, we need to add a spline to this. And we're going to do that via some user data. So we'll add user data. Just rename this spline and choose a spline type for the data type. And we can see that we've got this setting here. Now, what we need to do is just add three points. So we'll add our first there by command clicking, command click and command click to add the others. This particular point, we want to work with our left tangent and say minus 0.25. This one is already 0.25, so that's fine. This one we can say minus 0.25, and then we can set this at 0.5 along the x and one on the y axis. And that gives us a bell curve, and that's exactly what we need. So our rod will rise and then it will fall. Fantastic, so we'll hit OK, and we've got that bell curve in, and then we can just drop this in here and say spline is equal to op, and that gives us that data mapping available to us later on. Now, at frame zero, we've got to set things up. So if frame is equal to zero, we can say run is equal to zero, start underscore time is equal to zero, pause underscore y is equal to zero and finally height and this is not equal to zero it will be 106 and this relates to the height of the helixes that control the springs you'll see that get used a little bit later so moving on we can say if trigger is equal to true on this occasion we're going to say true colon and then if run is less than one, run is equal to one. If start time is less than one, start time is equal to, and it will be frame. So that sets up those two variables. Moving on from here, we can say if run is equal to one. 
And then we need to set up our monoflop and our range mappers, because on this occasion, we actually need two range mappers, one for the rods and the other for our helixes. That's the combination. Right, so duration is equal to, and it will be frame minus start underscore time. So that wherever we are on the timeline, we start from zero and then start counting from there for anybody who's not seen that before. OK, so we've got our duration variable set up and we can then say if duration is less than 10, because I want these to rise and fall over 10 frames. Range mapper. And it will be pause for this particular range mapper. And it will be is equal to C4D dot utils dot range map brackets duration comma and then 0 comma 10 for the input range and 0 comma 80 for the output range. So these if we select our rod here, they're starting at 0. And if we check the coordinates, we can see that our position Y is zeroed out. So they're going to rise up to 80 centimeters and then drop back to 0 over our 10 frames. We can then say true. And finally, spline. And that's our first range mapper set up. We can then say pos underscore y is equal to range mapper pos. And that will give us the correct value if we just open this up coming out of our position y. Just move that down there so that we've got it and we can refer to it. OK, fantastic. Moving on from here, then we can copy this range mapper and drop it in here and then make some adjustments. So everything is fine until we get to the output range. On this occasion, we want to say 106 and it will be 26. And because we are working from a higher value to a lower value, we need to put false in here. Now, I've been told I'm wrong about this and that this pertains to something else. Well, if you can get this to work with true, you're a lot cleverer than me because it does not work properly if you put true in there. So uh, I'm going to keep on putting false and knowing that that works properly. Let's move on. Height. Let's have a look. Height is equal to and this is range mapper pause. I just need to make this range mapper height and it will be range mapper underscore height. And there we go. We've got both our range mappers set out and this will give us a value at the height output here. We can then say at this level else. And it will simply be a case of run is equal to zero and start time is equal to zero. So once we've completed our cycle, we reset these two variables to zero and then they're set up and ready to go for our next cycle. And then our final lines else. And it will be pos y is equal to zero. Height is equal to one zero six. And that's as much as we need to do to get this output in the correct values. Let's do a quick check and see if it actually does work. So if we pull this rod in, give it an object port and also a position Y port. Just double click and with the control key out to make it bigger and then swap those around. If we place our position Y in the position Y and this link into the object. Let's see if anything actually does happen. Well, yeah, that's starting to go, isn't it? It did a couple of those. I mean, I think there's, there's still perhaps a, a little bit of an issue with this code. Let's have a quick look. Oh, <laughs> I see it. I've got a double equals in there. That wasn't being reset correctly. Let's see what happens now. 
Ah, that's better, isn't it? And we can see that that's working really nicely. So that part of our conundrum, if that's what we want to call it, <laughs> is working nicely. Moving on from here, then, we've got to think about working. Well, we might as well work with our helixes, get those working. So if we close the rods up, open our springs, and then we can think about moving on from here. If we just bring the Espresso editor back up here, we can bring in another linked list. Let's do that. And then we can think about populating it. We need these helixes, so we'll select all of them. That's all of those selected. We can then select the link list, the dropper, and bring those in. Fantastic. So we've got it that far, and we can use the freeze once again to select the index value, which will match these two together. That's great. We'll just bring that in there for now. And then we can, if we just get a hold of our first helix, bring this in here, give it an object port, and with the height, just bring this in here and object properties, height. Swap them around. Just double click to make it a little bigger. And we're ready to take a look and see what's going on here. Let's just see if this actually does anything. And we can see that that's working fine. We're getting the odd mishap with the dynamics on the spheres at the moment. I'm not too worried about that because we can sort that out, but we can see that our helixes and our rods are now synchronized and they're working fine. Fantastic. So that's great. Moving on from here, then we can think about where we're going next. And actually, we need to bring in a couple more link lists and populate those. So we might as well do that first and then we can move on and think about what we're going to do next. We'll just do a little bit of housekeeping here if we move let's just move this down so that it's not in the way and then we can bring in a couple more link lists I'll just command drag to copy these like that and then plumb the output of the freeze into both of the index ports and then we can think about populating so we can get rid of these what we need in the first one are our spheres so once again we'll Select all of them, select the link list once again, and then click to populate. And in this one, we need our light bases. So we'll select all of those. And do the same thing again. Get rid of these and we've got them fabulous so that's everything that we need within our link list now now what we need to check is for a collision between our spheres and the bases here the undersides obviously so what we'll do is bring in a dynamic collision node so we'll come down to bullet dynamics collision bring one of those in connect our spheres to object A and our light bases link list to object B. And then we'll be interested in what's coming out of here. Once again, if we grab a hold of our result node, we'll just bring this over here, plumb this into here, we can see what's going on. So let's just place this over here and play the timeline. And we can see that there's a number as soon as something hits we can see that it changes and that's what we need to use in order to switch on the lights now in order to do that we're going to be reaching for our old friend the python node once again and that's going to be our next step we'll bring a python node into the editor and as per usual we'll delete the ports we don't need any ports of the output on this occasion we just need four at the input stage now what we need we actually need let's have a quick look at my notes 
For a start, we want frame, so we need an integer. We want an index, which is another integer. We want hit, which will require another integer port. And finally, we want color. Now, color is actually a vector, so we'll bring that in there. Right, let's rename them. So frame. index hit and finally color fantastic so those are in we'll just remove that from there for now just drop it down there so I have frame let's just make this a little bigger Our frame will come from our time node. Just plug that back in there. That can be placed in there. The index, once again, will be coming from the freeze. The hit from the count. What's happened there? Did I not get that plumbed in? Yes, I did. OK. So that's plumbed in there. And finally, the color comes in from here. So that's all looking good. Let's just move these up a little bit, just to tidy things up. OK, so that's all fine. The next thing we can do is once again go back to our Python editor, just open that up, and we're ready to start doing a little more coding. As per usual, we can remove this line, but we can also remove output one from our globals because we don't need it we've got no outputs we do however need two global variables and they are on comma off because we're interested in switching lights on and off so we've got those set up now the next thing we need to do we just go up here we've got this light panels null and all of our light panels which are these objects here they're all stored in the light panels null. So we want to bring those in to the Python editor. So we can say light underscore panels is equal to, and it will be doc dot search object brackets single quotes light panels close single quotes to bring the null in we then need to bring in the children of that particular null so we can say light underscore panel is equal to and it will be light underscore panels dot get children open close let's just make sure that we spelt get correctly okay and that will bring all of these in so we've got it that far and now we can think about where we're going next well for a start we're going to define one single function so we'll say def and this will be switch underscore off and switch off will give a for loop so we'll say for i in range and it will be len brackets off double close because off will be a list and it will it won't always be 10 in length it will sometimes be 10 or at the beginning of the animation it will be 10 in length 10 index values in length and nine at all other points because obviously there's going to be one light switched on when all the remaining lights are switched off so it can't always be 10. so we can say x is equal to zero y is equal to zero and z 
is equal to zero and you'll see why when I do my next line so we can then say light underscore pane or panel I should say light underscore panel so we're interested in working with this chart this list here basically because a light light panel is actually a list and we can then say brackets off brackets I double close and then we need to work out how we're going to work with this so light panels if we just select this one and we go into our basic tab we've got a color pane here now if we grab a hold of that and bring that in we can just take away light panel zero we can then say is equal to and it will be c 4 d dot vector and it will simply be x comma y comma z and that will allow us to switch our light off by putting a black as we've got in here into any one of our panels colors so that's what we're doing now at the moment I've got the variable off in there now don't worry about that because that's not been defined yet but it will be so let's work out what we're going to do from here I mean it doesn't matter that it's not defined at this point because we've we're not called this function if we call that function now then we'll get an error because off is not defined but we're not going to do that yet okay so if frame is equal to zero so at the start of the animation now we can define off so off is equal to and it will be a list just containing the values zero through to nine so that we've got the index values for the light panels so zero comma one comma two comma three comma four comma five comma six seven eight and nine so that's off defined on is equal to an empty list at this stage we can then say switch underscore off and call the function at the beginning of the animation because we want all of the lights to be off at frame zero okay and that's going to do that here so that's our setup at the beginning of the animation complete we can now think about what we're going to be doing at every other stage so we can say if hit is greater than zero so if we've had a dynamics collision between a sphere and a light base here then we know that we're going to get a hit so if hit is greater than zero we want something to happen and that something of course is to switch on the appropriate light so how are we going to go about doing this well what we want is for the sphere to raise up hit this switch the light on and for the light to stay on until that process has repeated itself and then at that point this light will be switched off and the next light that's been hit will be switched on and the others will all remain off well in order to achieve that we've got to use some quite cunning logic and this is what we do so we say if len and it will be brackets on is greater than zero because obviously it can be at any other time other than frame zero because at all other times it's likely to have a light index value in it so that there's a light switched on so if, if it's greater than zero we can then say off dot insert and it will be on brackets zero comma on brackets zero so what's going to happen then is that if on has got an index value in it we'll say for example two so not one two it, this light would be on before we can switch that light off we need to place it back 
in here because it will have been actually removed from here in order for this to work so because that obviously if it's in on then this will have been removed from here and placed in on that's the way this is going to work so we've got to assume that it's not in there at the moment and we need to place it back in so on bracket zero is going to contain two so the, and the number two is at position two within the off index list so that's what we've got to do so that's why we say on bracket zero we place it at that position and that's how we do it that's it's quite cunning logic but it's it's that's the way it's going to work once we've done that we can then clear the on list and make it an empty list once again so we can say on dot clear open and close so that resets it however we've if this is not greater than zero obviously we've got to do something else so we can say else and that's something else is to say off dot pop and it will be index so whatever's coming in to this index value and that's coming from the freeze node remember we want to remove that value from the off list because that's going to be the light that's going to be switched on so moving on from here then we can say on dot and it will be insert brackets zero because it's an empty list at the moment so it's got to be inserted at zero point if you use any other value you're going to get an error because we've got nothing in there so at zero we want to insert and it will be index because obviously that's what we need so that's in there and that's going to switch the light on but not quite yet we then need to call switch off once again and that will switch all of the lights off that are currently in this list not including the one that's in the on list and that will make sure that all the remaining lights are going to be switched off we can then do the final stage which is to switch the light that needs to be switched on on and to do that we say well we can copy this up to here just drop that in there and then within our vector we can simply say color because we're getting the color from this condition and that's coming in here so that is how you go about doing it it's not many lines of code but it's just cunning logic clever logic that makes this work okay and that completes that part of the expression it's all done now let's see whether it works <laughs> we've got a syntax error there let's have a look 922 it might be because i just didn't finish everything off let's have a look see where we are light pad yes i did i've sorted that out so it's referring to something that was there earlier right let's go back to zero and see what we've got now stitch or sitch off is not defined i've obviously got something wrong in there yeah it's there just a syntax error let's just make that correct and let's just do that just execute again and i think we're okay so let's run the sequence and see what happens right well we've got all kinds of wonderful things happening there haven't we <laughs> i've never seen it do that before so i've clearly got an error somewhere <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll have to have a check through and see what's going on um, but there's definitely something very strange going on there I'm not quite sure what that is I'll have a quick check and then I'll come back to you and tell you what was wrong okay it's a couple of things the first thing is in the Python I should actually say on and it should be brackets zero in there because obviously we want the index value that's currently stored in the on list to be the one that switched on so on bracket zero make sure you put that in there the second thing that we need to do i've just noticed that the modulo has got nothing connected to it so we need to plumb that back in there so that's an issue that needed to be fixed let's see what happens now right now it's it, it's not perfect at the moment but it is working and you can see when it's triggered 
and we do actually trigger correctly, it does actually work. So the code is fine, I think. There's nothing that's there's nothing wrong with that. There's still a few things that we need to iron out here, a few creases that we need to iron out. But we can see that that is actually behaving quite nicely. Now, one of the problems we've got is that at zero, if any of these have been triggered and they haven't returned to their initial position, then they just get stuck where they are. And that presents us with a bit of a problem. Now, in order to fix that, we just need to add some more nodes. For a start, we need a second compare. And again, we're interested in our frames. So we can bring that into here. So we've got our second compare, the function and the input to we can leave as they are because we are interested in the start of the animation. So that's in. The next thing to do is bring in an iteration. So we'll bring one of those in here. And it wants to end at nine. It can start at zero because, of course, we're interested in our index values. So at zero, we're going to sequence through all of our rods and helixes, and then we're going to initialize them. That's what we're going to do. Now, in order to do that, we do need two condition nodes. So we'll bring those in. So we've got logic condition. We'll bring in two of those. Just move this down a little bit. Just drop that one in there and that one in there. We'll also move them over a little way. And then we need to worry about these two link lists. Now, let's have a look. We, we can move these over here and think about what we're going to be doing with these two link lists. What we'll do is just move these over here. Just put those somewhere there. Give ourselves a little bit more room. OK. Now, our link lists are going to be fed by our conditions. So if we're at zero, we're going to switch and we're going to be looking at our input number three. That's what we're going to be interested in. So we can then say that we want to plumb our iteration into there to allow us to sequence through all the index values. At all other times, we're going to want the output of the freeze. So we can disconnect these two from here, bring the freeze into here and into here, and then connect these to here. And that's as much as we need to actually do, because this will look after itself. We've got these two coming out of here, and we know that when we're at zero, these two are going to be set to their initial states. So therefore, we don't need to worry about anything else. We just simply need to be able to sequence through all of these at zero and reset our rods and reset the heights of our helixes, which control our springs. So that is it. That completes the expression. That's as much as we need to do. Now, let's have a play and see what exactly happens now. So if we play, there we go. It's already better. It's still not 100%, but it is better. Now, the dynamics are a little bit off just here and there. Now, what I'm going to do, if I just switch back to my standard layout, if I just switch to uh, a different view, let's have a look, see where we are. So, OK. Now, it might be that our spheres are just a little bit too close to these cylinder objects initially. Let's just just try moving them a little bit higher, say somewhere there, and see if this makes any difference. It may not, but it's worth a try. Yeah, there's still one there that's not working. Now, I don't know. Let's let's see. That's number seven. Let's have a look, see what we've got. So it'll be sphere six. See if there's anything in there. That's no, but they're all they're definitely all set up correctly. They're, they're all the same. They're all the same. Let's have a look, see what else we've got in there. No, we didn't change anything anywhere else. That's interesting. I've not seen it do this before. If needs be, 
we can command D, go into bullet dynamics here, expert. We've got our collision margin, our collision shapes. So look, see what else we've got. Steps per frame. If we make that 10 and make that 20, see if that improves things. No, there's still an issue, isn't there? That's very interesting. Right. It's just, a, yeah, it's odd ones here and there. Very interesting. All right. I'll tell you what, I'll do some more checking and then I'll come back to you when I've corrected the problem. OK, it's my bad. These cylinders in here where they've got their collider tags, they shouldn't be set to static mesh. They should be moving mesh. So let's just select all of those and get that set up. Yeah, it's just my mistake when I was making my notes. Let's just change that to a moving mesh and then see what happens now. If this doesn't work, I'll kick myself. <laughs> no, it should work. Yeah. Yeah, that's eradicated the problem. It's working fine. Yeah, no problems anymore. Fantastic, and that's working beautifully. So that is how you go about rigging a solenoid contraption. <laughs> but yeah, all working really beautifully and, and doing exactly what it should do. So yeah, that's great. I mean, the one thing you can do with the spheres is just move them back to where they were because they, they do drop a little bit now. If we just switch to... Uh, right hand view again so f3 and we can just drop these down somewhere there that should be okay if we just run the sequence that's better they're not dropping now but yeah that's how you go about doing it and that just about brings us to the end of this tutorial because that's everything that i wanted to show you and as always, I really hope this has inspired you and given you some ideas for things that you may be able to incorporate in your own projects. And if you have enjoyed the video, please give it a like. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel, leave a comment and, of course, ring the bell. And wherever you happen to be on social media, please, please do share this video because all this good stuff really does help keep the channel moving in the right direction. But anyway, that just about brings the curtain down on this one. So I'll see you very soon on the next tutorial.